the Dynamics presentation by Timothy Glasgow of Milwaukee University, and he will be speaking about Python programming in the sort of flipped physical chemistry classroom. Okay, uh, th thank you for the introduction. So I'll be honest, I am a, a little bit nervous <laughs> after a very nice presentation. Um, so I'm going to talk today, as I said, about uh, a project that uh, Stephen Nechaba and I, who was at the University of Puget Sound, uh, began together two years ago when I first started my teaching career at Millikan. Uh, where we, you know, do some introduce some Python into our physical chemistry class. So it's a little bit different than what you just heard about, where that was truly a programming in a in a science class. Whereas this is, we're still going to just teach PCHEM, but you know, now we're going to try and do some programming in it as well. Um, and so uh, I'm going to give a little bit of background about ourselves. Uh, and I know it may not be usual to do that, but there's a reason why I would. I think one of them is that we we, we have a pretty diverse a uh, group of students and communities, and uh, going through that, I think, will highlight one of the strengths of, I think, what we're doing. Um, so, like I said, I've only been teaching for, for two years. Um, I, this is something I jumped on when I first started teaching, and, and we started together. Uh, Steve's been teaching for over 20-some-odd years. I teach at Millican University, which is at Central, located in Central Illinois. Uh, most, most schools are about 2,000-ish total undergraduate students. Um, and it's a fairly regional draw. About 80% of our students come from Illinois. Another 10% sort of come from surrounding states. Puget Sound has a, a more national profile. It's, I don't know, I don't know their exact numbers, but uh, when I was a student there, 30 or 50% were from West Coast states, but certainly from all over the place. Uh, incoming student profiles are shown, and you know, I, you can sort of debate on how useful these metrics are or aren't. But they measure something at the very least, and so um, the Millican students, you know, are, are according to the ACT less prepared for college, pretty substantially than the Puget Sound students. Um, according to Forbes, Puget Sound is the 181st best college, and Millican is the 555th best college. Again, so you know, take that as as you will. Uh, specifically talking about my class rather than the university as a whole, uh, traditionally PCAM requires Calc one and two. Uh, that requirement had been relaxed before I got to Millikan, so that's why it's required there. So I've had some students take PCHEM without any calculus experience at all. Um, and now that the, I've, been, I've been there for, for a little bit of time and the requirements are sort of becoming more strict, I'm still having a lot of students that are having trouble completing them at Millikan. They have to go to a community college where the coursework's a little bit friendlier to, to their abilities. Uh, if you did sound Calc 1 and 2 is required, I don't know of any student that has a issue meeting that requirement. Calc 3 is recommended, um, and I think probably 80 or more percent of their students take Calc 3. In my class, I'd say, in the two years I've taught it, I'd say, you know, I've had two students who have taken Calc 3, and they're both physics majors. So, we also have different class sizes. My classes, my classes tend to be about 10 students. Central this class tends to be about 30 students. Like I said, I, I, I highlight these differences because uh, one of the things I want to get into is that, um, we have very different student populations, but we give them the same assignments, and they all get something out of it. And so what we're, what we're using the assignments for is a, a gateway into physical chemistry to help those that struggle with some of the concepts, um, and also for those that don't struggle as much with the concepts, a way to sort of further engage with the material, so, so provide depth while also providing sort of a foot in the door. So I didn't, I didn't know what the background of the audience was going to be. I know this is sort of a, a, a broad conference. Um, so just, you know, what is PCHEM? It's you study why chemistry happens, the physics underpinnings. A lot of chemistry majors sort of view it as the, the hardest course in, in, their, in their path to graduation, so much so, so that American Chemical Society used to sell these honk if you pass PCHEM bumper stickers. They didn't sell them for any organic or analytical or any of these other ones, so... I guess somebody thought it must be quite hard. And so why is it hard for students? Well, one of the problems is that it integrates a lot of different topics. So you need to know chemistry, you need to know physics, because that's what we're using to describe the chemistry, and you need to have some math knowledge, because that's you know, how we're going to you know, actually do the physics, solve the problems, if you will. Uh, and the math you need is sort of extensively varied. You need, as I said, up through Calc 3, so that's sort of multivariate calculus for and traditionally, you need differential equations, knowledge, you need linear algebra traditionally. Um, and so 
a lot of the students have some sort of spottiness in that they, you know, they're deficient in one of these three or, or all of them. The topics are fairly abstract. So we talk about gases and thermodynamics. These are things that you can't really see. They have three-dimensional relationships. So if you're a football fan, you certainly potentially know that the Patriots are acutely aware of the fact that the pressure is related to the volume <laughs> and the temperature. Um, and so you can imagine that we would want some sort of three-dimensional service that would say, what is the pressure at you know, this set of volume and temperature? And what is it at some other volume and temperature? And, and that's something that's really hard to imagine in our head, I think. Uh, and then when we talk about quantum mechanics, which is sort of the other semester of PCHEM, now we're talking about a different problem that we're talking about macroscopic things that we couldn't see, and now we're talking about microscopic, sub-microscopic things that we can't see. That sort of follow a whole different set of rules than we're used to. And I think what all this leads to is that it doesn't really seem real, and I mean that's not really the right word, but it doesn't seem relevant to the students. But I think the problem isn't really that it's not relevant, it's that I think they don't always understand the relevance. They think they're just doing math, and they don't really want to do math. That's why they're not math majors. <laughs> so how can we make PCHEM more accessible and make it where they're learning chemistry rather than sort of doing math? And the obvious answer is to let computers do the math for them. Right? Computers are, are really great at this. They don't have any problem. They haven't taken Calc 3 and they don't need to. <laughs> and so like, we're trying to come up with a catchy name for this. And so far, I thought of intuition over integrals or chemistry before calculus or so, you know, some, something, something clever, I guess. And again, I, I'm a sort of a terrible artist. I can't really even draw 2D things on the board, let alone 3D things. So again, that's something computers are really great at, and that they can do, you know, generate these images and sort of manipulate them. And, and so they might not be able to visualize them in, in their head, but once they generate them on a computer, they can sort of look at them through that. And uh, as was brought up in a, 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 an earlier session, you know, what? OK, if this is such a great idea, probably people have probably already done it. And, and some people have. So I'm, you know, I'm not going to say that we're the first people that stumble upon this wonderful idea. But uh, one of the things is that people do use programs like Mathematica or MathCAD. And uh, those aren't real programming languages, no, no offense, Mathematica. But um, it's not really, I don't think, a translatable skill to the workplace often. And also, they cost money. And Millikan, to be honest, is not really a very wealthy university. So uh, you know we're going to use Python just like they use Python. So so why Python? And so I'll sort of just give a quick a quick rundown through this. So it's got dynamic typing. So anyone who's done programming before, you know, a lot of languages require you to sort of say these are the variables I'm going to use, and this is what type of variables they are, and that's very confusing for students. Um, so in Python, you don't need to declare your variables at the top. And I should I should say now that uh, in my class, no students so far have had any programming background. We don't even have a computer science department at Millikan. Um, it's easy to read, so it primarily uses English keywords. That was one of the goals in developing the Python language, is that they wanted it to be easy to read. It's an interpreted language, which is not really quite, you know, it's not really a true thing to say exactly, but there's no need to compile. So a lot of times, other programming languages, you need to compile and then run a compiled program. This is sort of all integrated into one. And uh, as I mentioned before, it's got an extensive selection of open source mathematical and scientific libraries. So Python was not developed as a, as a scientific platform in any way whatsoever. But because it's open source, people said this is great and, and developed an extensive number you know, of, of these libraries. And so many so that now companies you know, package all of these different libraries that people have come up with and distribute them at cost, potentially. But you have an academic email address, you get them for free. So it's something that's been thousands of dollars for potentially from Canopy. If you just have a .edu at the end of your name, you get it for free. So this is great for our students, so they're not paying for Mathematica or MathCAD. So then the question becomes is that my students have no programming skills, and they're not really very good at, sometimes at PCAM, that's why we're doing this. So what's, is there's a kind of a, gonna be a time issue and so this is where the sort of flipped classroom comes in. I think I use a majority of the scheduled class times, two thirds, three quarters, to sort of just teach, you know, the standard way and stand at the chalkboard and then write on it and derive some stuff and give sample problems to students to work out together and you know just the traditional traditional teaching methods. And the content of those lectures is all PCAP. There's no no Python content at all. And I use a quarter of the class period for in-class Python activities, sort of like uh, what uh, Liz and Mark described. 
So the way we do this is we post the Python-based assignments online. Ours are also these IPython notebooks. And they include some background information to read through, some pre-lab questions I call them to answer. And then I post on YouTube some video lectures covering the coding and sort of how to require for the assignment. So we're sneaking in some, some coding you know, lectures without taking up sort of normal class time. And, and we try and keep the videos five to 10 minutes each, although each assignment might have more than one video. And the videos are specific to the assignments? They're specific to that assignment. So, you know, this is the first assignment is on probability density. And then if you go to YouTube and search my name, you would find, you know, three probability densities videos, basically. Um, and I'll be honest, so far they're, all, they're only okay. And they're sort of, you know, in, in, in improving as, as we go along. Um, so this is one of our IPython notebooks, and like so this one is looking at you know how does the speed of a gas you know gas in a room change if we change the temperature, um, and so we have some objective at the end of the assignment we, we want you to be able to do this, some learning self assessment. So again, at the end we should you should be able to do in this case these eight things, and you should demonstrate to us that you can do those eight things, and then some background information which I'll show a little bit of. So here's some more of it there. I, you know, I haven't, obviously I haven't shown the whole introduction. It ends up being probably two to five pages if you were to type it out in Word. Um, you know, some, some are more, some are less. And then at the end of the introduction, it's sort of what do you do to get ready for this activity? Uh, this is a pre-lab assignment, so in this case, it would have written down, and, and they keep a, a, a lab notebook, we call it, just like a journal to write down. Uh, they would have written down equations 1 through 11. They would have gone in their book or online and looked up some constants. They had to use the trapezoidal rule in this assignment to do some integration. And so we had to go online and you know remember what the trapezoidal rule is if it's something you've forgotten. And a couple other sort of things. And then after that, sort of what are you going to turn in next meeting on Monday? And they'll somehow submit their IPython notebook electronically. We're not so fancy as to publish them on the web, unfortunately. So they turn them in through Dropbox, usually. Uh, and then they'll also hand in their sort of physical copy of their lab notebook, which they sort of engage the material with. Okay, so after that, we have some in-class activities, and as uh, was described, you know, the IPython notebooks have these markdown windows as well as code windows, so that we sort of integrate them together, where here would be a markdown that says, in the next cell, do this. And we kind of have a different approach than, than what Mark and Liz have, partially because the, the course is different, so we don't have as much time to spend on coding. This is just part of our, our true PCHEM class. So this is our very first assignment besides we had a sort of a little Python tutorial assignment the week before. And, and what, what I've shown here is the template of exactly what they get. So this is if you went to the web and downloaded, you would get exactly this. So this first code cell would run. It would give you, it would, there's no errors in it, it's, it's perfect and that would run. But what you might be able to see is that it's set up to, to look at velocities between minus 1,000 and 1,000. But the assignment wanted them to do minus 2,000 to 2,000. Instead of to look at temperatures from 200 to 300, we wanted 100 to 1,000. So the very first code that they write is simply changing negative 1,000 and 1,000 to negative 2,000 and 2,000. And, and same thing with sort of the cell below. And then again, we sort of set up for them how to generate images this very first time. And uh, I haven't shown it here, but I'll show an example. So, so the first image they generate in the course is a 3D image of uh, velocity distributions as we change the temperature. So here, here they are. I didn't, I didn't think I had to sort of bring two separate computers, unfortunately. Um, so I just, I sort of did the cheap way out, and I, I just took the image that it generates, and then, like I said, they're 3D rot you know, rotatable, and I just rotated them and took different screenshots. So this one would be, you know, what does the distribution look like at low temperatures? Is sort of the one closest to you. Here's what it looks like at high temperatures. So they're supposed to get that. It, you know, gets wider and, and shorter, and you can sort of hear the side view that sort of emphasizes that. Uh, so they have images like this where they, they can rotate them and, and sort of get an idea of these three-dimensional relationships. Also in this assignment, uh, again, instead of not just looking at distributions, we want them to sort of think about, you know, what, what are average velocities, for instance, or average of the square of the velocity. Um, and so again, so something as simple as in this cell changing 500 to 300 is easy enough to do. Um, this is the equations 
that they'd be working with. This is how you would calculate the average velocity mathematically. It's how you calculate the average of the square of the velocity mathematically. And so we tell them, you know, okay, here's the code for getting these two parts of this equation. But we also want the cube of the velocity, the average of the cube of the velocity, and the fourth power. And so we've left the space for them to do that, but they have to actually copy and paste it in and sort of change the square to a cube and so on and so forth. I should emphasize that in the video, it doesn't just say, copy what we did. It says, like, here's what we're doing so you know, and in future you will be expected to do it without as much guidance. Um, I wanted to highlight just the readability here, is that uh, when, I kind of remember this equation off the top of my head when I was making this presentation, and I could, I could type it out by looking just at the Python code. So again, that sort of goes into how readable is Python as a programming language versus, you know, Fortran or, or, or something else that you might, C++ or something you might have worked with in the past. Uh, and again, so we want them to calculate all these and they'll be using the trapezoidal rule. We have it set up to do the first one and they would need to set it up to do the next three. Um, and this is an integral that's, and it's not hard. It's actually quite trivial if, if, if you, if you no symmetry, but the students see this and they are terrified. This is like the most frightening thing they've ever seen in their entire life. Um, and so they kind of freeze and say, I don't know what to do and I give up. And using these assignments is a way to say, don't give up because we're going to have a computer do it for you and then you're going to find out that this actually is a really easy integral. There's one not to run away from, it's this one. Um, and we'll sort of show them pictorially why that is. So we also have them plot the integrands, and so they can see here why that first integral is quite trivial because it's it's zero by symmetry, and why the second integral is maybe not quite so trivial. Um, and then after that, uh, you can see you know moving down uh, the, the I find on notebook that in in you know as we go down the markdowns and the code cells, there are pause for analysis questions where we sort of expect them to engage the material a little bit more deeply. Um, so, you know, just write down the numbers and sketch these integrands for each of the four that you're supposed to have calculated. Um, your guided advice makes sense. So, you, you know, we're trying to teach them. You might not really remember calculus very well, but here's sort of a quick review of some, some topics you might have learned if you took the course. Um, okay, and then, you know, think about why you got zero. So, physically why you might have gotten zero as the average velocity. So, there's sort of levels of, of uh, engagement where the first one is like, okay, if you're not good at math, this question might be kind of hard, but try and engage it. If you're good at math, you're gonna fly right through this one and on to the next one. And so we sort of layer these questions up, I think, so that no student is bored, but no student feels like, this is way too hard, I, I have to give up. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on to uh, another, another, uh, another, module that we did, and, and I'll, I'm going to run through the next couple because I, just didn't, I didn't know exactly what Mark and Liz were going to include, so some of these are a little bit more scattershot than I would sort of like to present. But another, another thing we look at is, is visualizing the internal energy as a function of volume and temperature. So this is a common thing to look at in, in, uh, in physical chem and thermodynamics classrooms. And uh, one of the issues is that if you have a a function that's a you know a function of two variables. If you want to take some derivatives, you have to use partial derivatives and and use uh, sort of multivariate calculus, which, as I said, basically none of my students have seen, and uh, some of Nesh of the students have seen it, but a lot you know a fair number have struggled with it. So we try and emphasize pictorially what a partial derivative is, and and help them get at that before they have to actually do a partial derivative, you know, by hand. So here's, here's two graphs that they might generate, and one is what's the internal energy at, as you vary the temperature at some constant volume. So we give them three different types of gases, and they, the two different curves look different depending on what type of gas they are, and they can get some information from that. And we have them highlight the fact that you know, this, the slope at any point of this curve is changing, and that that's a useful thing, and it's it's a, a, a known quantity, and, and that it's the heat capacity, um, and that uh, um, 
it, it is a particle derivative, and that, that's all a partial derivative is. It's just a slope. It's just like a regular derivative. It just has sort of a funny D, as opposed to the sort of more normal one. That same thing down here, and now we can look at, okay, so this is how U changes if we change the temperature at some constant volume. Here's how U changes if we change the volume at some constant temperature. And again, you can get some physical information about uh, you know, what these slopes mean and, and why they're changing. And, and they're not so scary to just look at in a picture, and later on you have some intuition about what they should be at certain, maybe certain volumes, for instance. So you can use that as a, a way to check your numbers if you do it by hand. And as I said, uh, we're sort of big on generating 3D images, and that builds in, in terms of what we're looking at here. Is that now, um, what, one of the big ish, one of the big topics in, in, in physical chemistry is this idea that you have what are called state functions, where um, it doesn't matter how you go from this point to this point. The change in the internal energy is the same if you sort of take this very direct teal path or this sort of less direct magenta or red path. And the students have a, a real tough time understanding that for reasons that are not abundantly clear to me. But this, I think, helps them to see that, okay, uh, all I'm doing is just the exact, making the exact same curve that you just saw. I'm, I'm just now doing them on a 3D surface as opposed to sort of a, maybe a 2D window that's a bit easier to see where here I'm changing the temperature holding the volume constant, and then once I get there, I'm changing the volume holding the temperature constant. And uh, I think once you do that, I, I think the students have had a better engagement with you know, this sort of path independence topic. Uh, another thing that I like about these is that we can go into even higher level topics that are, are sort of way above uh, our students' understanding. So perturbation theory, uh, I don't, I, I, sorry, I don't know what everyone's background is in terms of chemistry, physics, or whatnot, but perturbation theory is something that chemists, especially computational chemists, use every day. But the math behind perturbation theory is a little bit intricate and probably above a lot of undergraduate chemistry's head. So a lot of courses have it removed entirely. And that's pretty unfortunate because it's a very important topic. And so what we can sort of use is we can use these IPython notebooks to say, okay, we're going to hide the math from you, because we don't really care if you can do the perturbation theory math. If you want to do that, go to graduate school and you know get a PhD in physical chemistry. Um, but we do want you to have some intuition about what it means to do that, and and why someone might do that. And so uh, again, this is sort of just a quick cut of that. They can sort of see, okay, if I do perturbation theory, I get a slightly different energy from an eigenvalue problem, and I get a slightly different eigenfunction. So they see the results, they have some understanding of what it means to do perturbation theory, but they don't have to do the sort of slog through two or three days of math to, to do it, because they don't care, and then they're going to hate perturbation theory by the end of that sort of, you know, de deriving perturbation theory anyway. And there's one example of student work, so uh, like I said, this is a student notebook that we collect. And one of the things I really liked, and I don't know if anyone else went to this talk from uh, the psychologists and engineers up upstairs in the last session. But uh, they said that this is a way to peer into your students' heads. And uh, I, I really like this in that I can have them try to explain stuff to me, and so the students that are, are better can really engage these questions, and I can push them to engage them more, and I have time to give them feedback that I wouldn't in class. Uh, and like I, I, then I'm able to see where are their sort of slight misunderstandings. I'm sorry that this isn't coming through through very well, but the student here really nailed a, a, an answer, and I said, this is really great, but here's where you might be sort of, you know, missing the point with some, some chicken scratch that hopefully you can read. Um, and so just to recap some of the positives, is that I think it makes it accessible to a, di a diverse audience, which, like I said, we have sort of two very different audiences, the Puget Sound PCHEM class and the Millikan PCHEM class. Within my own class, I have a pretty diverse audience as well. Like I said, I've had some students who have taken no calculus get through PCHEM with a, a B plus, um, and literally actually like new PCHEM. It wasn't like I just said, I feel bad that you never took calculus. Here's a B plus. <laughs> um, and so like I said, our, our, our catchphrase I'm trying to, to catch on, get to catch on. Uh, so it, it gives an entry point. So it's, if you're not very good, here's a way to get in the door. And it also provides for depth, so the better students aren't bored. 
which again goes to sort of the diversity question. Teaches some basic programming skills, which I think are important. I said we, we don't have any computer science department at Milliken, and when I was at Puget Sound, I didn't take a computer science class, and I don't think many students there do. Uh, and, and we can sort of peer into our students' heads with these student journals and improve our dialogue with our students. Some things I've learned is to keep the videos short. Uh, so my students once told me, they said, I don't, watch your, I don't watch all your videos. When I first did this, I made 20 some odd minute videos. I said, I don't watch them, they're too long. I said, okay, would you watch them if I made four or five minute videos? They said, yes. <laughs> so, I did point out to them that that's actually more time investment. Um, but so they have, and you can, I can watch the calendars on the YouTube videos, and I can see that they, they all watch them. Um, I would say that one of the differences is that I'm trying to do content, not programming. Like programming is an important skill, but it's secondary to what I'm doing. So I'm trying to make it as accessible to students as possible, so that's not a hurdle that's to, you know a difficult hurdle to overcome. So in our first assignment, like I said, they're just changing numbers while sort of learning as they go, and towards the end of the semester, then it's sort of more, I want you to solve this, this problem, go ahead and do it, right? write the code from scratch. Um, and one of the things I, I, I say this is a lesson to learn, but I don't know if it is, it's something I'm thinking about doing is sort of including Python in the standard homework. So I still have a lot of my students do integrals and derivatives that sort of are really hard for them. But I, sort of why am I doing that? I don't, I don't know why. And they don't know why I'm doing it either. So if, if I let them do it in Python, then A, it reinforces their Python programming skills, which will make them hopefully better programmers at the end. And B, it, it sort of gives them this idea that uh, you should take advantage of technology. If you get a job, your employer is not going to say, oh, man, you just did this heroic integration by hand that took an hour. I'm going to totally hire you as opposed to the person who you know, did it on a computer and did six problems in an hour. You know, maybe maybe isn't as heroic as you are, but you know, got the job done you know six times as fast. That's all I have. So, you know, any questions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have just a few minutes left. But any questions for either Tim or Mark? Is it fair to say then that um, you don't need the students to be able to do calculus; you just need them to understand calculus? Yeah, I think that's somewhat fair. Yeah, you know, I, certainly if they can understand calculus, at least what the calculus is telling them, right? You know, like I said, uh, a lot of my students don't really understand even that an integral tells you the area under a curve. So I want them to know that, even if they can't do it themselves. They don't. Really, they don't really remember that a derivative is a slope. So I want them to remember that rather than necessarily do it themselves. Yeah. So your iPod, IPython notebook is not hosted? No, we don't host ours. So I just make the computer, the students sort of slug in their own computers um, every Friday that we do these. And uh, so far, we haven't run into any issues with not, none of them having laptops. That's sort of worked out pretty luckily, I guess. Um, one student's so, uh, computer stopped sort of working in the middle of the semester in terms of Python just wouldn't run anymore for reasons I didn't have time to ever figure out. So I just gave them a department laptop to use on those class periods. Um, but no, I, I don't host it on a server. I, I, I do think that's a, a better way to do it, though, in some ways. For, for either of the groups of speakers here, is the speed of Python important for any of the applications that you dealt with? Uh, for me, it's not because it's, we're not really doing sort of more in-depth things. Python is not necessarily the fastest uh, language. But it's faster than, for example, a lot of the things that you do, you could use Excel for that. Correct. Um, yes, I think in some ways it's faster than Excel. Um, just but because that may not be relevant to the problem. It, correct. No, it's not, it's not relevant in, in terms of uh, e either way. There's no taxing on the computer system. They're they're fairly simple simple problems anyway. It's my experience. I don't know about for from them. There were only a couple of occasions where uh, students could actually measure the time that passed to do a calculation on a watch, uh, and often that was because there were many students doing the same calculation at the same time and passing. It has a reputation of not being as fast as some other languages, but for our application. Thank you.
Well, I'm just wondering when you're when you're showing students two-dimensional images of three-dimensional graphs, I would think there would be some students who don't know what they're looking at who, who really cannot interpret that as a three-dimensional object, even though you can sort of you know show them different views. And I was wondering if you had experimented at all with any techniques that would allow you to have a smooth three-dimensional object um, to manipulate. I have not uh, uh, experimented with that, to be honest. So certainly that that is an issue, and I sort of do my best to really sort of, you know, just grab a piece of paper and just really want to think about it that way. But that's sort of the only in-person manipulable that I that I would sort of so have. Can do that. Okay. Yeah. I'm fairly confident. I'm fairly confident. I, I guess I, I, I thought I didn't understand the question. Maybe not in this context, though. I mean, they weren't. Maybe you were just showing us. But were they able to take their graphs? And oh, yeah, yeah, certainly. Sorry, I didn't do that just because I'm not running it. I misunderstood your question. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Certainly, yeah, you can. It will pop up, and you can just grab it and click it. I just, the stills that I showed oh, were okay. stills sorry. after I had manipulated it. So, yeah, I can just grab them and it's just, yeah. And unfortunately, we are out of time, but please feel free to continue on during the break.